Thank you. Uh, so I'm really uh, delighted to be here in the birthplace of Max Born. He's uh, one of my heroes now, for sure. Um, and uh, I want to continue where, in some sense, Laurent stopped. I'll give you a, this one page, sort of busy page, uh, summary of uh, what Laurent said about relative locality, but maybe just emphasize things that maybe he didn't say. Well, first of all, he didn't mention the paper that he was a co-author of with these four musketeers here, uh, including Giovanni, I guess, who should be around, but maybe he's asleep, and uh, Yerji, and uh, I guess the fourth musketeer, D'Artagnan, is in Waterloo. Uh, and so, sorry? Okay, Toronto, yeah, that's right. So, um, so this was, uh, it's a wonderful idea from uh, 2011, but in some sense it's uh, resurrecting um, old ideas uh, Max Borns, definitely, um, but also uh, some of the uh, papers written by David Finkelstein and I guess John Wheeler also muttered about some things. So the idea is that in principle, right, in physics we're given a system and then you can have different points of view on the system. Let's say you call that box a space-time. And uh, Wheeler, right, as usual, you know, he has these inspirational ideas, um, uh, uh, wanted to say that, well, you know, in principle, I don't know, if you think about from the point of view of cosmology, different people see different systems, okay? And so you can find some papers of David Finkelstein uh, in the mid-80s, but um, as uh, uh, Laurent pointed out, and, and uh, these author, I mean, they pointed out in their paper from 2011, The Four Musketeers, that, you know, this really goes back to Born's idea. And I like to think about Born's idea really from the point of the measurement. Okay, so you say like, okay, suppose I pick a pointer basis, and that's x. Very good. That's a puzzle. <laughs> Why do you pick a basis? Right? Well, you might say like, I don't know, the coherence, quantum Darwinism, whatever your favorite thing is, right? How you pick a basis. You're David Bohm, you say you don't pick a basis. It's just different point of view. Okay, but still, you are, you have you measure in x. But then the, uh, Max Born said, like, well, you measure an x, but x is dynamical. Well, whatever, the structure on x is dynamical. In some sense, x does not exist by general relativity. So therefore, p should not exist, <laughs> or it's as dynamical as x. Okay? Uh, and, of course, you use p, right, to get the information, right? You, you, you measure, I don't know, vertices by adding energy momenta um, in a, you know, in order to observe things. So you might argue actually that you always observe in energy momentum space. So that's maybe one extra point uh, that I wanted to mention. Um, as uh, Laurent also said, uh, one of the consequences of this viewpoint, if you take this as a foundational, fundamental idea, if you take this as an analog of the equivalence principle, let's say, or relativity, at least relativity in the special relativistic setting, okay, so this should give you a lot of stuff. Relativity gave you predictions like E equals MC squared and whatnot. And so, um, uh, given this idea, we need some implementation of it. And we need an implementation in a context where the fundamental scale for X is related to the fundamental scale for P. You know, Laurent called it lambda for X and epsilon for P, right? These fundamental scales somehow have to be related. Well, they're related to attention. So give me a system where energy is proportional to the size. Maybe there are many systems, but we know one, <laughs> okay? And that's definitely string theory, right? It's just a harmonic oscillator. You quantize, you have an infinite number of harmonic oscillators, right? And um, here is a system. Now, of course, if you're in 4D, uh, you can translate the tension, as Laurent said, to the G Newton and so forth. But, okay, here is a model, okay? Maybe it's not a model that, uh, you know, ultimately will be the overarching formulation of relative locality, but it's always good to have a model, okay? And we, mo we call that model uh, metastring, okay? You might say, like, well, that's quite pretentious. What do you mean by this? Well, you know, it is, we're going to be using the techniques of string theory, okay? A and lots of things uh, people will recognize, like, I don't know, Rami or whoever else was doing string theory, that's, uh, you know, they will recognize some of the philosophy from the 80s. Okay, but somehow we got lost on the way. We dropped this partially because you know the field developed in a certain technical directions, and because the problems are hard, 
or implementation of philosophy was hard. So we want to go back to the implement, uh, implementation of this philosophy, and that's why we're going to want to back off from sort of the name of string theory, you know, which usually you know, in people's minds has to do with you know producing a certain background, and maybe in that background you're going to also induce standard model-like things and so forth. And so that's why we're talking about meta, because the background really would be phase space, or as Laurent said, is the geometry of quantization. Now, if you're a string theorist and someone says, like, you know, string theory is about geometry of quantization, I think you should be surprised. Okay? I mean, <laughs> it's, it's basically telling you that the string now is not going to weave and produce, let's say, space time, which is some picture that people had before. It's actually weaving and producing the geometry of quantization, in some sense, should be really underlying this puzzling thing that we call quantum theory. All right, so the usual uh, notion, of course, is we have some maps, right, from a Riemann surface to some target space-time. Let's say, take it uh, as a Polyakov string. So you have some two-dimensional field theory, and of course, it's going to be a quantum field theory, but it's a particular quantum field theory which has some lots of symmetry, uh, 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 related basically to local real scaling, so uh, um, uh, conformal field theory. And um, you'd look at the sort of CFT consistency, uh, let's say like the, the fact that you're going to be basically writing a local world sheet theory or uh, there are some issues about the global transformations, uh, modular invariance, uh, various other symmetries that you might be having in the description. And then you want to reinterpret this from the target space. Okay, And, of course, if you wanted to interpret from the point of view, uh, from the usual point of view, well, okay, so you have some causality, you have unitarity, and, of course, you want to relate to the physics you know. As Laurent pointed out, well, locality is the basis of the physics you know. In particular, you want to relate, I don't know, GR. <laughs> so you have the PDEs, right, Einstein's equations, uh, and they look local. But um, in some sense, you know, this is too much. I mean, so you see, you see, an interpretation has been grafted onto string theory. All right, so what we say is, and you know, other people have observed, like Gabriele Valenciano, but again, it was not really developed, is, well, okay, so it seems like in this interpretation, you are really breaking Born reciprocity. You are picking a basis. You know, you're calling the target space is space time. But you know, if you were to write the, uh, uh, if you were to write the Hamiltonian constraint of string theory, and P here is just del tau, the world sheet time, if you want, of this x, okay? And delta, I write it over here, is basically del sigma of that. Okay, so the Hamiltonian constraint P squared plus del squared, and the formorphism constraint is a dot. Well, that's, that, that has born reciprocity in it. Okay, so in some sense, you're breaking born reciprocity, even though the theory tells you that he has born reciprocity, okay? And I'm just talking about the simplest possible case, uh, flat target space, you know, everything is going to be free, you know, so we can solve it, nothing complicated, okay? So just the simplest possible example. And this goes way back also to, uh, uh, you see, how you put locality in string theory. Well, it's really put in in assuming that if you take this field, the world sheet field, around 2 pi for sigma, you basically, in the usual string theory, you get back to itself. Unless, of course, you put, you assume that, I don't know, target space is such that it has some compact directions, let's say you put it on a torus or something, there are some assumed isometries or whatever, and then you get some deltas which you interpret as some winding modes of the string. We are saying, like, even in the non-compact case, there is a freedom in the theory to do this. You know, in principle, you should have this monodromies. So why wouldn't the string theorists put monodromies? Because immediately they would say that there's something non-local happening on the world sheet. In other words, you tear the world sheet. Okay? And you will see that actually you can have monodromy in this phase space description, and you will not have to tear the world sheet. It just, it, you know, it, it, it really, you just follow the nose. Well, it took a while <laughs> to build all of this. Uh, but... Uh, but you basically find out that, there, that there's nothing inherent in string theory that tells you that you have to do this, to, to uh, uh, tear the wall sheet, or I'll say, like, okay, I'm doing something that's completely legal. As Laurent also pointed out, 
there is this interesting thing about t-duality. Well, if you look at the string, right, what is this? Just a free string. It's just the wave equations in two dimensions. All right, so you have advanced mode, you have the retarded mode. So in principle, you have these two modes, left moving mode, the right moving mode. And um, I think maybe it was in one of the transparencies, like basically, it's always a puzzle. It's been a puzzle in string theory how to sort of um, have a description that somehow liberates the left and right and then sort of put it together. So what would that mean? Well, okay, here is your solution, okay, and then you take the orthogonal one, okay? So in principle, of course, now you have the x left and x right, and you would get this, right, because the t-duality would mix x with this y, the orthogonal solution. And then you just basically say, like, well, you know, my relative locality instructs me, right, to put these two together. You know, Laurent had this x, right? called x, which was x divided by lambda, y divided by epsilon. And so you should formulate everything in terms of this guy, uh, this guy and allow for general monodromies. All right, so relative locality now tells us, I'm going to just write down this answer. Okay, so this, this type of action, well, not quite, but this type of action has been discussed in the literature by people like Zeitlin, people who work with Carl Boson will call this Florianini jakiv action or whatever, but you see, it's some type of theory, right, where now you have a chiral description. There's a del tau x, there's a del sigma x. So this looks like a PQ dot or whatever, if you want, in your Hamiltonian description. And, and, and you have your symmetric information. You have some tensor here. Well, you decompose into symmetric and the anti-symmetric, right? And uh, this is precisely the eta that Laurent talked about and the omega. Yes? Sorry? All right. <laughs> okay, so that's the first part. Does it look better? Okay. All right, so, so you know, he has this kind of chiral structure. Anyone who knows a little bit about chiral bosons or, let's say, Chern-Simons theory, if you take, for example, a, uh, you know, discussion of quantum Hall effect, and you look at the edge excitations, so you put basically your two-dimensional electron gas in the magnetic field, right? So now you're going to have a chirality because magnetic field defined the direction. Right, so you go on the edge excitation is going to go, let's say, like that, if your magnetic field goes like that. Okay, basically what you're going to be having at the boundary is, is this type of structure. And then this type of sort of non-universal, well, non-universal coming from matter. Um, uh, but that's basically, that's basically the action, right, that you, that you say now incorporates all the elements of uh, relative locality. Okay, so he has the eta, he has the m, uh, omega, he has the HB. HB has the space-time part, it has the energy-momentum part. Um, omega, you can sort of, the simplest possible case, actually in string theory, implicitly you will see it's there, just but it's keep it, it, you keep it constant. Okay, and here is your omega. All right, so this is the implementation. And as Laurent mentioned, it, there is this prediction, right? And actually from this action, you can read off the fundamental non-commutativity in this prediction. The fundamental non-commutativity is the bold axis, right, the Poisson bracket at equal time, is basically determined by this relative locality metric, right, and then some step function. Okay, so this is, you know, so this, this basically tells you that it's essentially, uh, you know, uh, string theory properly formulated in geometry of quantization is a non-commutative theory. Covariantly non-commutative. Axes have covariant, I mean, they, they, you know, they have space-time indices and energy-momentum indices. Okay, so now there's an issue of interpretation, as uh, Laurent mentioned, and this is this modular interpretation. In other words, you have to define, in some sense, the analog of the quantum uh, Lagrangian, right? The thing that is sort of, if you want, null with respect to eta, right? And that leads you to the commutative subalgebra 
of the full operator algebra. So basically, x is in p commute, okay, and the classical space-time, as Lorenzo was saying, is the squeezing, right, of the phase space volume, right, where the thickness of p is infinitesimal. So usually we just put g newton equal to zero, right? So we don't even think of p, <laughs> right? That's the usual quantum field theory. G newton equals to zero. There is no p. There is an infinite space time. It's Minkowski. We're, we work on it. But we basically say, like, that's not true. And that really a person who pointed it out, that this is the essence of quantum theory, okay? It's Aharonov. Aharonov for years has been trying to say, trying to distill what quantum theory is. Well, it also comes out, right? Well, okay, so in general, eta will be dynamical. Yeah, well, okay, so, yeah, yeah. But eta will be dynamical, so in general, you know, if, you're, if you love, I don't know, a minimal length uncertainty principles or something, take eta as a function of x, expand it in Riemann normal coordinates in x and p, so you're going to get your Bohr reciprocic minimal length. And there were some, paper, uh, some uh, talks afternoon talks about the minimal length, and they all usually screw up Born reciprocity. I've written papers that screw up Born reciprocity. They're probably wrong, <laughs> but it tells you how this could uh, emerge. Okay? So this is the reason for all of these things, the ma minimal length and so forth. Okay? And, okay, so space-time is some type of extensification, and again, this is where this uh, measurement problem comes in. I can imagine this in a cosmological setting, right? But then, you know, you have to have zillions and zillions of, uh, of measurements, right, that are somehow related to this emergence of space-time out of this, if you want, the quantum egg. Now, I want to go back to this point that Aharono made. Aharono made a point that quantum theory, in some sense, is this theory, okay, that reconciles fundamental non-locality with causality. All right, so you do your EPR, but you don't send information. So there's a non-locality in quantum theory which as he claims, is embedded in these observables, and as far as I know, this is the first time that fundamental physics produced something like this, right? I mean, understanding of fundamental physics. If you talk to our quantum foundation friends they, who care about this, they would say something like this. All right, so let's go to some uh, technical details. All right, so the Polyakov action usually is just a classical action like this, right? And uh, you assume that, uh, 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 that there is a periodicity in X, right? So, uh, in, in general, you can have quasi-periodicity. It will not change anything. Uh, we can assume non-compactness. So, if you want, this discussion does not have anything to do with any uh, isometries, any, you know, circles, tori, or whatever you want to put in, right? And, uh, and you say, like, okay, well, uh, you just take the path integral and just open it up on a state. Okay, so this is the Polyakov path integral. You just open it up. Okay, you're summing over axes, you're summing over two-dimensional metric, right? And you open it up, and there is a state. Well, you say, like, I assume that x now is periodic. Well, do a Fourier transform. And if you do a Fourier transform, you will find out that y, right, the Fourier transform of x, so in some sense you could say, like, well, I, uh, heck, x has a p, let's dualize a p. Right? And then basically rewrite it P as a dy, rewrite everything in terms of y, but then y will be quasi-periodic. So even if you think that the string tells you that x is periodic, quantum the theory tells you it's not. Because if you look at the different paces, it will be quasi-periodic. Okay, so again, the point, I guess, to be uh, uh, brought home here is that there is some information here in this description which is much more general than usual. Right? And this information you can see in the phase space description, as, as actually, that's how our discussion started, right, in uh, 2011. It's like, okay, well, you know, if you look at 2011 paper by the four musketeers, they have a particle in the phase space. So what's the phase space description of the string? Here it is. Then you go and say, like, well, I mean, did people consider this? <laughs> I mean, you know, why, why didn't they consider this? Okay. So, uh, in principle, you might say, well, okay, well, this uh, uh, rewritings are all local, right, when you integrate x, but actually you can do it on a genus G uh, Riemann surface, and you'll see that there is some type of uh, Lorentzian worship come in. Another thing is, is, you know, in the uh, string, right, basically when you do that, you get the, Fourier the kernel of the Fourier transfer. But that, in some sense, when exponentiated, this thing, right, defines what you call a vertex operator. 
right? In other words, there will be delta function support uh, on particular points, x, in your space-time interpretation. Well, now, this typical px type of thing has to be enlarged, right? Because you have to have a Born reciprocity guy. And so, in principle, we have a, some type of, if you call this guy electric, uh, dual, magnetic dual of the operator. So you work with this operator, which are dionic operators. Again, this is known in the context of T-duality, if you have isometries, if you put something on a torus. But in this case, again, we say even in the general non-compact case, these are inevitable operators. And you have some electromagnetic duality with quantization of the charges and uh, Dirac quantization and so forth, which is, again, more uh, symmetric. All right. So you say, OK, well, so uh, that means that you know, this quasi-periodicity is just inevitable. And it seems that the best way to, to do it, and, and t-duality in some sense, is just the Fourier transform. And, that, and that's, a, that's just the implementation of Born reciprocity, if you want, in the quantum formulation of the string. But is the Polyakov string the whole thing? So, okay, let's rewrite it again. You, know, you, you start like this. If you eliminate it p, you will get the usual Polyakov string. right? And then you say, like, okay, suppose I'm inspired by Hamiltonian formalism and decompose this way. By the way, here there might be more freedom. As a matter of fact, you can back up, and we've been backing up in recent discussion, and say, like, is the Polyakov the correct starting point? Okay, there might be actually some other things there. Okay, because after all, you have two-dimensional diffeomorphism, so you have to live with this conundrum that I guess uh, Laurent alluded to, which is basically regularization of diffeos, but even in the 2D case. Okay, so is there something there, and there is actually a structure which is more indicative of the sort of fully background independent uh, uh, description, even from the point of view of, of the world sheets. But, all right, and, and, and then this, this decomposition. Well, okay, maybe you fix the gauge. Is there some freedom here in the description? Let me go this way, derive this action, and then, you know, we can just say, like, there's these open questions we're looking at that are sort of, again, questions that people have addressed in the 80s, but never fully uh, uh, developed or, or understood. Okay, so again. Um, okay, so basically what you do, you decompose this, right? And then use the equations of motions for the uh, components in the sigma and tau direction. You plug back in, right? Um, you eliminate, you just uh, rewrite everything sort of uh, in the uh, local, you know, P being basically the uh, D of Y. Um, and um, you just, okay, expand this, okay? And you say like, okay, well, I don't know. I'm now inspired by uh, Born reciprocity or, you know, you say like, okay, in the double field formalism or something, people use something like that. Uh, but, you know, double field formalism as singular as, as Polyakov in this description. Okay, what do I end up? I end up with this action. We call this Zaitlin action, or maybe Floriani Jakeev Zaitlin action, because Zaitlin Arkady was the first one really to look at it. But I think even Arkady didn't care about this omega part, because it does look like it's a total derivative in the action. But again, you should be very careful about because of the global issues. And again, you should keep all the couplings. <laughs> Okay, to this order, and there was an infinite number of couplings because all of these will, in principle, run in string theory. All right, so you go to curve background. You say, okay, you're doing some baby example. How about some Jimmy News and whatever string couples to an anti-symmetric field, like a charged particle couples to the vector field? Or, well, actually, there is a Zaitlin action with this. So it's just basically H has become this. Um, Ada's you still uh, keep fixed. So in some sense, the B field is automatically incorporated. Uh, you know, in this uh, uh, phase space, uh, or if you want to be conservative, call it double, but it's really phase space because you have the omega. I mean. All right, and other, uh, some other technical details are actually that the action has to be generalized, right? Because, you know, these are now couplings. I mean, they're not numbers. In principle, they depend on x, or if you did not, if you kept them sort of constant, again, quantum theory, when you start doing the path integral, I will write an analog sort of path integral here, but let's say you just integrate over the d-axis, right? You will, you will basically find out that these guys in general run because they're couplings for the, in this two-dimensional theory. It's a quantum field theory. All right, so um, again, you know, there are some special cases over here. There's some nice structure that you see that the Hamiltonians, the del sigmas, uh, contracted by H, and the diffeomorphisms are basically del signals con contracted by eta. So in some sense, you know, you keep these on the same footing in this description. 
if they are dynamical, right, you would basically have to impose uh, the rules of conformal field theory. So in other words, you know, this as a coupling, derivative of that with respect to some uh, uh, floating scale have to be equal to zero, or for this coupling, or for this coupling. So in principle, you get equations for these guys. And actually, Laurent's student, Barak Shashani, uh, recently looked at conformal perturbation theory. And roughly what you're getting is that the fluctuations of a, uh, H's and eta's around this fixed uh, ODD eta or O2, 2D minus 1H, right, basically satisfy the equations which are very similar to these equations that Laurent was writing for some type of phi, right, that lives on this uh, modular space time. All right, so in principle, uh, Right, there are equations for all of these. Notice that in double field theory setting, uh, this is kept constant, like in the Polyaco. Uh, double field theory, as I say, is this theory that in principle doubles the target space, but it's motivated by trying to incorporate T-duality but in some type of supergravity type of description. Again, uh, a description based on geometry, maybe generalized geometry of target space, but not a phase space description where all of these have to run. Okay, and usually omega is ignored. Okay, there is a bit about this Lorentzian world sheet. So sometimes you'll find these papers, uh, you know, even by the leaders in the field, um, like Ed Witten a couple of years back had a paper in which basically say, if you take a Euclidean uh, description, well, even the Veneziano amplitude is not defined. <laughs> it's a strictly infinite. And this is the beginning of the field. Remember, Veneziano amplitude was this, uh, just an amplitude before string theory. You write down that uh, it's analytic, it's... Uh, you know, satisfy causality, unitarity, all of this thing, crossing, right? The, uh, you know, axioms of the S matrix. It doesn't have anything to do with the string theory. Okay, but then if you naively do it from the Euclidean point of view, it doesn't really exist. So you have to do some, you know, it's, it's a beta function. So it's, you have to do like what you do in what I can Watson. You have to find the Paul contour and so forth, but then from the quantum field theory setting. So that means you have to do a Lorentzian at some point. <laughs> All right, so here, basically, uh, m uh, basically because of the issue of modular invariance, let's see, uh, when do I have to stop? Have 15, minutes. 15 minutes, okay. Okay. So, uh, so, uh, so basically because of the issue that, you see, uh, from this point, the description is chiral, right? So, you see, we, we don't have the t, the, uh, tau, tau term, right? Tau sigma, sigma, sigma. You might say, like, well, qu quantum theory is going to basically bring this guy back, but can talk about it uh, uh, as, as sort of details of this RG calculation, so let, let me not e even go there. But uh, so basically, you see sigma and tau distinguished in the Satan action. But in principle, right, you know, you have to uh, worry about the proper global definition of, of this theory. And what you find out is, well, for general monodromies, okay, um, first of all, you find out, okay, to have a modular invariance and I have a chiral theory, what can I do? Well, you have to put this theory on a lattice, but a lattice that is self-dual. So you take a lattice, you take the dual lattice, and you make it itself. Then a chiral theory makes sense. You have a modular invariant uh, uh, partition function. And uh, so this will tell you that basically you have to work with some lattice description. So that means you have to sum uh, over the monodromies. You also have to sum of sort of the analogs of the moduli Right, it is generally Lorentzian description. And then you do a pattern. This is the naive prescription, the analog, if you want, of the, of the Polyako prescription, uh, but from the meta string point of view. And the Polyako prescription is somehow singular limit of this. And this, in general, is a transition amplitude. It's not an S matrix. It, it, there's no target space interpretation to this. Um, there is a, a nice technology here, which is purely mathematical, goes way back to sort of trying to understand. Uh, uh, formulations like open string field theory and so forth. Uh, you recognize some uh, string theorists here and some mathematicians. And Nakamura has done this, and, and Laurent has a paper with Sanjay Ramgulam uh, about just the, the mathematics of this. This is, this is just interesting from the point of view of uh, how do you devise a description so that preserves modular invariance, right? So you, how do you cut your, uh, your world sheet? And there is a way to do this and in the sort of strips. And, um, and that's the uh, Nakamura prescription. Let's not go there. All right. Let's address this question about, so chiral, allowable monodromies, phase space description, right? A Lorentzian world sheets. Well, what happened to this uh, torn world sheets? How do you repair that? 
Well, let's take the simplest possible case, okay, which is you take a cylinder, okay, and okay, so closed string boundary condition, you have to devise now, okay, so locality is always in this, uh, or lack of it in the boundary conditions. How do you get a continuous world ship? You basically say that symplectic flux across the cut has to be continuous and also independent where you make a cut. So there's no torn world ship. Uh, monodromy appears basically as a discontinu discontinuity across the cut and it's just generic. Okay. Now, in principle, uh, you can generalize this also omega does not appear in the symplectic structure. Uh, there are formula that I guess didn't write here, but uh, uh, that, that showed this explicitly, so the eta basically control everything. Open string boundary condition is the symplectic uh, flux must vanish at the physical boundary. So now you can construct your d-brains if you want. Okay? And they look basically as if you want Lagrangians, right, in this phase space description, if you want the... Uh, uh, um, uh, and you have sort of, uh, I don't know, the Neumann uh, cases and the Dirichlet cases, you can have the mixed Robin cases and so forth. All right, so the final th uh, thing that I wanted to point out here, or maybe I have another slide, sorry, about strings, is, okay, so if you're a GR person, let's say you would say, okay, well, let's define the observables. Now you have your diffuse constraints written. So if you just, you know, want to solve them, you'll find basically any function of X, right? Um, and, uh, and you just dot it with this del sigma x integrate over, uh, over x, and you know, you commute the two, okay? So you, I told you what the xx is, xx Poisson bracket is eta, so you can compute, okay? <laughs> and there will be basically ter three terms, right? The usual term, the usual Poisson, and then the ones where basically you're gonna get the xx contractions, either eta or the, or the non-local ones where you basically have to uh, sort of take a string, and then sort of use the fact that, uh, you know, the string, right, you can elongate it, and you can elongate it, right, and then basically it just splits, okay? Now, this type of structure, so you said sort of have a non-local part, and you have this leftover, if you want to call it local part, the whole bracket is associative. This is one thing about non-associativity, you know, I got confused about this many times, but Laurent straightened out many, many ways. I guess it goes back, back to Cartan or something. You see, you can have a non-associative structure very easily. Well, you forget the part of associative structure. Okay? In double field theory, this is the Quran bracket. Actually, this is the simplest way of thinking of Quran bracket. It's non-associative. It's been discovered in this beautiful context by Quran. Uh, you know, Siegel in, in, uh, in the context of physics, Quran was a mathematician, I guess, to know Einstein and so forth. Anyway, so people talk about this beautiful, right, but they completely neglect this. Why? Because basically they, you know, impose a constraint, right, that you're always on a on on non-split state, right? So you're, you're, you're sort of imposing a very strong uh, constraint. This has to do with the fact that uh, in the diffeomorphism con uh, constraint, this n and n tilde have to match. Right? So you basically truncated your theory, all right? Uh, where, whereas the theory is uh, associative, non-commutative. Now, there is a funny thing here, and the funny thing is that if you take the uh, Poisson bracket of two observables, actually, it's not an observable. <laughs> you know, so, so you have to basically go and see, in some sense, this is classical anomaly, which is, I guess, uh, reminiscent of what happens in general relativity all the time. And then you have to see how quantization repairs this. And the answer is very beautiful. That's actually the reason why there is a modular space-time. You just basically impose um, uh, a condition, right, which you say, like, well, I'm on a self-dual lattice, so I have to be sort of compatible with the description, the lattice description. I have some exponentials, right, which is sort of periodic on that lattice. That lattice, by the way, is unique, okay? This is the lattice that exists if we want a critical string in 26 direct, uh, dimensions, but it's 25,1. If you imagine this lattice, right, if you're doing here, and this is exactly the lattice the Borchardt used in these constructions, you're basically saying that all directions are of the size of the string lambda scale. So you have this compact egg, including the temporal direction. 20 years ago, people wrote papers like this. There's a group, uh, Greg Moore paper, finite in all direction, and what does he say? Like any physicist would say, 
I give you a time on a compact direction. That doesn't make sense. Well, of course, it doesn't make sense if you live in space time. <laughs> it makes perfect sense, oops, <laughs> it makes perfect sense if you live in mod uh, modular space time. You actually interpret it uh, in the way uh, Laurent was addressing in those couple of slides. Uh, so basically, you take the uh, com uh, commut uh, commutative subalgebra of this non uh, full non commutative description, and therefore now you can make sense of quantum mechanically of this thing that comes into mathematical constructions like Borchardt's algebras and things like that. And Borchardt's algebras are then, you know, sort of the symmetry algebras for all the operators in the um, for the al al operator algebra in this description. Okay, let me just mention a couple more uh, uh, things and then I want to go to the last slide, which is uh, important, uh, I think, for us to always think about, which is that, okay, so this theory, uh, you know, uh, you have to impose the constraints of while, it doesn't have wall sheet Lorentz, it would have, you know, once you flow, you do your RG flow, hit the fixed point, that, that description I uh, is uh, fully Lorentz, uh, you put sort of Weil and Lorentz on the same footing, like you're putting the Hamiltonian uh, diffeomorphisms on the same footing. In principle, from the point of view of the usual description, you don't have level matching. So you have other states, okay? So coherent states of these uh, dionic vertex operators, in some sense, create this curved phase space. Okay, yeah, I'm, 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 okay. So, and then basically you find that uh, for the, uh, you know, there are other, uh, like a diloton and a dual diloton, whatever. People know this double field theory. Let me talk about this one. So this is a bizarre one. It's a vector field that carries a target space index and the world sheet index. It would not be allowed in the usual string theory. I mean, it, it's kind of violates locality because, you know, it sort of mixes internal space world sheet with target space. But actually, this one appears in the usual RG computations in the Polyakov string model at the third loop. Quantum theory would tell you this thing is in. If quantum theory tells you something is in, you better take it. Because it will be, pr if it produces it, then he has to come back if this is a consistent full quantum description. This was discovered by Osborne and I think Zetlin and others. So, you know, he has to be on the spectrum. Why did we disregard this guy in the spectrum? Well, because of space-time interpretation. You say, like, well, it doesn't exist, right? It's non-local. There's no effective field theory for it. Okay, let's throw it. Well, <laughs> okay. All right, so let me talk about the last bit, which is sort of... Okay, so, so the message here is that somehow there is, okay, this, this was a discussion of the meta string following Laurent's talk, that in some, but okay, coming back maybe to the big picture is, we should be looking crucially in quantum gravity for non-local physics. All right, so you might say like, okay, so you can say that, that's great, but I don't see any non-local physics, so take a hike around the city of Rotzlo. <laughs> I don't want to listen to you, okay? So, so where is this non-local physics? Okay, so you might say like, well, it, there is a prediction of this. In Flats case, there is no Minkowski space, whatever, there's this modular space-time. So that's a prediction. Someone has to shine <laughs> a probe on this modular space-time and see a diffraction <laughs> of that. Okay, where do I see this? Uh, we have to ask a cosmologist. All right, so you say like, okay, well, you know, I have a uh, uh, phenomenologist friends, actually, one of the friends who, once we published paper, we'll run to get on a torsion. Uh, Tatsu Takuchi, he always asked me this, like, okay, why do I care about quantum gravity? You guys all get excited, you have conferences, you go to Wroclaw or some other nice place. <laughs> what, to tell me that I can't see effects on the Planck scale? <laughs> I know that! <laughs> why? Why do you get excited? Well, okay, as a particle, you might say, like, well, it's this UVIR business, right? There is this, some type of spreading, black hole, well, okay. Who's going to ever see a black hole and information paradox unless you do it in fluids? So, you know, we, you know it's like a Talmudic discussion. <laughs> Everyone has to have their point of view. But we'll never check. <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, okay, so, uh, so then, uh, you know, okay, so, well, one obvious one. Okay, I'm going to list obvious ones. I'm not going to be, you know, tremendously imaginative. <laughs> okay, yeah, otherwise I would say, let's look and then we know. I'm falsified or, you know. Okay, so one obvious is the vacuum energy, right? That mixes the UV and the IR. Okay, and as we noticed uh, in uh, some discussions, but of course we need a curved uh, description of this to really make this believable to anyone. You have two scales. 
They can play against each other. And that's precisely what people have observed numerologically, right? The vacuum energy scale is basically two scales beating around each other. One is basically the scale of particle physics, the other one is the Planck scale. So could it be that actually, even at the TV, you could be discovering things um, that are associated with, with this particular phenomenon? Then there's the issue of the hierarchy problem, which is basically why the scale m is so much less than m plane. Well, from this point of view, you would say, why is it uh, so bigger, whatever, than the <laughs> Hubble energy? I mean, 10 to the minus 4 electron volts, I mean, 10 to the minus 3 electron volts to the fourth, whatever, 10 to the minus, whatever scales you compare, energy scale. 10 to the minus 3, uh, 4 electron volts is a condensed matter scale. Okay, why is it not tiny? Why is it 126 GeV? Okay. So you have two scales now to, in principle, compare. Uh, all right, so uh, uh, non-locality in the standard model. This is, again, something uh, uh, I've been involved uh, uh, with, uh, with, with precisely the friend I mentioned, Tatsuta Kyuchi, and former postdoc uh, and, and a student, uh, Chun San and uh, Fuka Idemir. It's uh, Here's uh, Alan Kohn has been talking for years about this non-commutative rewriting of the standard model, where the Higgs is basically a non-commutative, discrete direction. No one takes him seriously. I think we were the first to take, from a particle physics point of view, in a recent paper, seriously. I mean, no one. T I mean, physicists don't take him seriously. There's lots of people work on it, but it's mathematical work. I just got an email from Chamsudin saying that that's a wrong claim because we put it in the paper. All right, no, Rami is correct. So it's really how you phrase this. I think he should have phrased it the following way that mathematicians will never love to phrase it. And of course, I'm speaking for him. This is how I view it. He has a prediction. He has a huge prediction. Okay? And that's why there was a wrong prediction. He predicts that the standard model is completed by left-right symmetric completion, which is unified. These degrees of freedom these degrees of freedom do mix with the Higgs and can lower the mass to 126 without any problem. But you have to say there will be new degrees of freedom. So you know what it is? It's like, okay, you know, guillotine me, Robespierre. He didn't want to do that. A physicist would do that. That's what we are saying. Uh, okay, so is that, but again, is this an indication, right? You're basically saying the standard model physics has a 10 to the 16 GeV physics. And at the same scale, it's left-right symmetric complete drops down to the TV scale. Again, there's non-commutativity. There's left-right rebelration. So that's very similar to this uh, philosophy they've been basically trying to tell you. There's also issues with uh, 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 people were saying something about uh, uh, dark matter, the appearance of sort of fundamental lower acceleration, the Milgram scaling. This is something also that I've been doing with a bunch of astronomers. You know, dark matter doesn't have to be local in principle, right? Maybe it's like the stringy gauge field that we say. Various other places. Anyway, so um, I'm told to stop. Thank you very much. I'm cutting. Okay, so uh, a tribute to Max Born, a remarkable physicist, uh, one of the inventors of uh, quantum mechanics uh, uh, and the inventor of Born reciprocity, Born infill theory, BBGKY, pioneer special relativity, all sorts of things, specific heats, lattice dynamics. A remarkable, remarkable person who, is, um, who was born here. And, um, okay, we are saying that, uh, you know, quantum, there, there, you know, there's nothing that forbids curved momentum space. So if you follow Gelman, it should be compulsory, and you can read all the other ones. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thomas. So, uh, wait, wait, wait. So this uh, string theoretic uh, formulation, uh, phase space formulation, is it actually 52 dimensional, if I understood it correctly, or? N no, well, okay, you, yeah, there, the lattice is a self-dual lattice that has a 26, 1, 26, 1, but it's self-dual, yeah. right? So, so in some sense, you know, 
it's really compact, and then basically what has to happen is to open up these directions. Right. And you might ask, like, okay, why do you open three spatial and one temporal? Right. Yeah. So, so, so uh, yeah. My question is, I mean, is there any difference uh, when it comes to the central charge is? Ex yeah, the central charge. Is, oh, you mean? Uh, yeah. I mean, how do you, in the end? I mean, what would you get in a, as an effective field theory in low low energies, right? Well, the effective field theory would be the mod the theory on this modular space time. By the way, this is another message here. Okay, Wilson has thought out how to understand normalization, correct? In analogy with statistical physics, condensed matter physics. But he, even he, or no one else, has resolved this issue. Why is quantum field theory possible? Quantum theory is non-local, <laughs> fundamentally. Okay? And we graphed space-time, Lorentz, on it in an index space. And then we treat it. Okay? Now, one has to resolve this. A proposal here is that properly to define a quantum field... Quantum field theory, in some sense, is essentially singular. You should properly define it a modular space time. Then in the ex extensification, okay, this is the true Wilsonian quantum formulation quantum field theory. Then in some limit, it becomes what you call a Wilsonian with a semi classical space time. But you're saying there is no Well, I mean, you know, you have the thickness, I mean, you have to basically find, right, the probes. So everything is about the probes. I know, but, you know, if you were, if you were to find a probe that would probe the thickness of P space, I mean, you know, if, if I tell G Newton goes to zero, then there is no thickness of P space. So you would say, like, okay, I don't care about it. But that's, bec that's a probe-dependent statement. If you probe everything LHC with particles, with local quantum field theory, quanta, well, you know, you're just, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So you have to find a probe that will probe the thickness. I mean, we're, you know, okay. Right, so we had time for one more question. Now we have time to thank the speaker <laughs> again. Okay.